I've been waiting for so long to do this series called A Little Bit of Wisdom. Um, hasn't, hasn't wisdom helped us, you know? A little bit of wisdom helped us. In the last few months, have you ever had somebody walk up to you and give you a piece of advice that kind of changed your uh, life and trajectory? It probably helped you to make a good decision. In fact, I had one person uh, in the month of January who was talking to me uh, about ministry and, and, and the kind of uh, um, you know, transition that we were going through as a church. I was going through it personally as a leader, and I was talking to this man of God, and he, he told me a very important thing, and it was a good piece of wisdom. He said, hey, listen, when it comes to the kingdom of God and the work of God, emotions should not overtake the work of God. Your emotions should not rule how you serve God. You know, that's what he told me. It, it really helped me a lot. It really helped me to make some good decisions. Some decisions that would have, you know, I would have postponed given a choice. I would have postponed coming to elementary from Tabernacle. I would have postponed a lot of stuff. But I'm glad um, I had somebody who walked up to me and, and dared enough to tell me, don't let your emotions stop you from doing what God wants you to do. You would have had some people like that who had given you a little bit of wisdom, simple piece of wisdom that kind of changed everything that you did. That kind of helped you to make good decisions, right decisions. Sometimes decisions you didn't like, but you know they were necessary. Life, the entire, our, our life is a series of decisions. Decisions, good decisions, bad decisions, right decisions, wrong decisions, but life is a series of decisions. Oh, how much we wish that we would make our life work with good decisions. Because we know that every now and then the life around us, uh, life uh, throws a curveball at us, throws a stumbling block at us. Um, as, we, as, we, as, we, as we are cruising well, we find ourselves facing a big wall, facing a stumbling block, facing a bump, and you just didn't know, you just don't know how to react to that at that point of time. Um, a financial struggle, or, or, a, or a job change struggle, or, or a relationship struggle, or a moral, ethical question, you know, ethical, ethical struggle, a health struggle, or probably a spiritual struggle. But we often face our life, uh, face in our life, things like this, that will make us stop for a moment and wonder, I wish I know a little bit of wisdom, I wish I've had a little, bit, a little more wisdom so that I could make good decisions, right decisions, so that I can make my life better. The Bible has its own how to make life work literature. We call it wisdom literature. Specifically, three books written by a king called Solomon actually give us a lot of wisdom about life, about different areas of our lives, financial, relationships, morality, ethics, um, spiritual, health, uh, friendships, life at large, speaking, relationships, everything, you know, all all kinds of things. He covered a lot of stuff. In those three books, he has put together um, so much wisdom. We're not going to go through all the three books. We're going to just focus on one book. And of course, we keep going back to the other two books that he has written, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. All three of them are called wisdom literature, the Old Testament. Now, usually we have a very simple rule in our church. That each year... We have one book study. We don't do more book studies. We just do one book study and one character study and, you know, things like that. We have a system by, by which we want to teach you. But this year, while we did already our book study, which is James, we did a series called Real Mature from the book of James. We covered the entire book of James and taught you uh, wisdom for practical Christianity. Um, but when we were doing that series, I felt that I need to teach you Proverbs this year too. Uh, I know it's a second book that we're going to do, but there's so much for us to learn uh, for every day's life that I thought it'll be good. Now, I know to, to do the entire Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is going to take forever, eternity for us, right? So what I'm going to do is just take bits and pieces of wisdom from there, uh, specifically theme it around certain things, uh, or, you know, pertaining our lives and what does the wise man offer to us? A little bit of wisdom. Every week, we will look at one piece of wisdom that we can learn about certain area of our life. Relationships, our words, our jobs, you know, friendships. We'll talk about those things. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at this series called Little Bit of Wisdom 
and learn seven good things, seven pieces of wisdom for our life uh, from this book. If you look at the book of Proverbs, the first nine chapters, he spends time making a case for wisdom. He talks about why is wisdom, what, why is it important for us to have wisdom, what is wisdom, where does the wisdom begin, what can wisdom do for us. If, there is, uh, if, if, you, if you don't have a reading pattern, of, uh, you know, Bible reading pattern for you every day, or even if you have, I would challenge you throughout this series, memorize the first nine chapters of Proverbs. Go back and memorize the first nine chapters of It's going to change your life. Man, it helps us so much uh, because it's going to keep teaching us why is it important for us to have wisdom in life. That without wisdom, we will mess up everything in our lives. Without wisdom from God, we will make bad choices, wrong decisions, end up in wrong relationships, invest in wrong places, and find ourselves in a very, even a sinkhole, you know, sinking down. If you want to avoid problems, if you want to avoid mistakes, I know you can't avoid problems, but mistakes. If you want to avoid bad relationships, if you want to avoid bad investments, this book is the best book to read. The first nine chapters teach us um, on why is it wisdom, and the rest of the chapters, that is from verse, chapter 10 to, uh, to the end of Proverbs, it's, it's almost a list of Proverbs. Like, you know, they are not categorized even. Each, each verse is a wisdom, piece of wisdom by itself. And so what we did for this series is pick up those things and try and categorize them for us to have a better understanding of Proverbs. Does that make sense? So that we can have a much better learning. And obviously, we are not going to look at everything that the wise man talks about. It's, it's just our, our, our goal is that we can create a little bit of interest inside you so that you would go back and study on yourself and learn more. Um, so we'll focus primarily on the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, though we will grab some more insights from the other two books uh, too. So why Proverbs? Why we are talking about wisdom? Let me ask that question and then uh, answer that question and then we will look at uh, this entire sermon into two parts. Why? Three reasons why we are doing this. It's not in your notes, so you want to write down your notes. All right, if you need a notes, we have notes ready for you. So this is a good habit that capstonians need to develop. Start writing your notes. Start writing your notes. You won't forget anything. All right, so why wisdom? Number one, because wisdom is supreme. Because wisdom is supreme. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 7 says like this. Wisdom is supreme. Repeat after me. Wisdom is supreme. There is nothing better than wisdom in this world. There is nothing that you can acquire better than, uh, you know, uh, uh, more than wisdom in your life. In fact, he goes on to say, get wisdom. Yes, though it costs all your possessions, get understanding. What he's saying is this, irrespective of how much you've got, sell all that to get some wisdom. Because wisdom is supreme. It dictates your life. It directs your life. It helps you to make good decisions in your life. Wisdom is supreme. That's one reason. Number two, wisdom is good. Wisdom is good. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Let me read that. That is the text for today. In fact, out of that, I'm going to teach you a lot of stuff. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them to do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become wise, wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. By exploring the meaning of these proverbs and parables, the words are wise and their riddles. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and discipline. In seven verses, he talks about why wisdom is good. At least he gives you three reasons why wisdom is good. I'm already giving you three reasons why we are studying wisdom, right? Now, why wisdom is good? He says wisdom is good because it's practical. You want to be successful in life? Have wisdom that comes from the word of God. Get this wisdom so that you can actually be successful in everything that you do. It's a practical thing. 
That's why we are going, we are learning wisdom. We're learning Proverbs. Number two, wisdom is good because wisdom is thought provoking. It helps you to live a disciplined life. It helps you to make good decisions even though they are hard decisions, you will still make them because you know this is the right way to do it. They are thought provoking. Wisdom, proverbs are intentionally provoking by the way. They help you to, be, to, 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 to live a disciplined life. In fact, verses 2 and 3, he repeats the word discipline twice, right? In verses 2 he says, well, I'm teaching you all this so that you can have discipline. I'm teaching you all this so that you can have a disciplined life. They are thought-provoking. Wisdom is good. Wisdom is good because they are pragmatic. They are pragmatic. They are not some theories. They can actually be applied in your everyday life. They can be applied in your personal uh, uh, relationships. They can be applied when you, you know, in your words, the way you talk. They can be applied in your business, in making good investments, right investments. They are they're, 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 they're pragmatic in every area of your life. I mean, they, you can actually use them. They are not some, some theory there, right? And that's why wisdom is good. They help you um, um, to make uh, your life better. So wisdom is supreme. Wisdom is good. Number three, wisdom is salvation. Wisdom saves you. Wisdom saves you a lot of heartache. Wisdom saves you a lot of pain. Wisdom helps you to avoid a lot of difficult circumstances. Because you made good choices, you will avoid problems in your life. You will avoid problematic people in your life. You will avoid, in fact, you will, you will become a better conflict resolver. You will become better at negotiations. You will become better at friendships. You will become better at doing your business. Wisdom is the salvation for us. Solomon, from the beginning of this book itself, begins to encourage us like a father talking to a son, saying that we must pursue wisdom. We must search for wisdom. Chapter 2, look at chapter 2, verses 1. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like a hidden treasures. Look at how many times he's act. He's almost literally begging us, you know. He's saying, hey, don't ignore wisdom. Search for it. Look for it. You will find it. It's like a treasure, man. It's better than silver. It's better than gold. It's, uh, it saves us. It saves us a lot of, from, from, from being a failure. The reason it is salvation is because in Proverbs chapter 26, verses 12, he gives the opposite case. He says this, do you see a man in his own eyes? Do you see a man wise in his, in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There is more hope for a fool than for him. Fool is one of the worst designated terms for you know for people in the Bible. We're going to come to that. You know, one of the types of people in the in the Proverbs. Fool is a really bad character, according to the wise man. He says even a fool can be saved, but a guy who thinks he knows everything, he doesn't have a hope. So just in case any one of you think, I already know all this, man, this is for you. This is for you. Be careful. I've already read proud so many times. I already know what you're going to say. Nah. You're, a, you're worse than a fool. There is hope for a fool, not for you. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Wisdom saves us. That's why we need to pursue wisdom. So what is wisdom? Now, I cannot define it exactly as it is, but I can, from the Bible itself, I'll show you uh, in verses 2, verses 3, he basically puts together what wisdom looks like. The purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them to do what is right, what is just, and what is fair. Wisdom is doing what is right, what is just, and what is fair. In other words, what is the will of God? Every time you make a decision, every time you utter a word, every time you make your move, make sure it is right, it is just, and, is, and, it, is the, and it is fair in the sight of God. That is wisdom. The problem is we don't do that. 
we'll mess up in one of those three areas, we might actually mess up all these three areas. Just, right, and fair. And that's why a lot of our decisions cost us quite a bit. So the wise man is saying, I'm trying to teach you so that you will make right decisions, you will make just decisions, and you will make fair decisions. So wisdom is basically knowing what is right, what is just, and what is fair, and doing it. That is wisdom. According to the Bible. You see, we, we usually confuse wisdom with knowledge. Let me clarify that for you, because um, the wisdom, the word wisdom and knowledge, both those words are recurring themes in the Bible. But while they both are related, they are not synonyms. They are not connected to each other. They are related, but they are not synonyms. Dictionary defines wisdom as the ability to discern or judge what is true, right and lasting. I mean, they are so close to the scripture. Oxford Dictionary. The ability to discern or judge what is true, right and lasting. While knowledge, on the other hand, is information gained through experience, reasoning or acquaintance. In other words, by study or you know, learning from somebody else. Information gained through re experience, reasoning, or acquaintance. Now, here is the point. Knowledge can exist without wisdom. Some of you are experts in the Bible. Some of you know a lot of scriptures. Probably some of you know better than me. You know, you memorize them from your childhood. Knowledge can exist without wisdom because I can have all the knowledge of the scripture and yet don't apply them in my personal life at all. Absolutely. But wisdom, on the other hand, cannot exist without knowledge. You need to have knowledge. That's how you apply them in your personal lives, right? Knowledge is like <clears throat> knowing how to use a gun. That you can study a gun, you can, uh, you, know, uh, you know, probably, you even write a book on how to use a gun, uh, um, uh, how to assemble a gun, disassemble a gun, how to pull it up, uh, put a bullet in, in, in a gun, uh, how, to, how to aim at a target. You can study all that. But wisdom is knowing when to use the gun. Make sense? So knowledge is knowing how to, how to use a gun, but wisdom is, of course, when to use it or when to keep it holstered. Dr. Billy Graham was much, more, much, 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 much better when he, when he compared knowledge and wisdom. He says this, knowledge is horizontal, while wisdom is vertical. Knowledge can be gained through everything that is around us. But wisdom comes only from above. It is vertical. Knowledge understands God, by, while wisdom walks with God. That's the difference. Some of you have knowledge of Jesus so much, but you don't actually walk with Jesus. In fact, this whole series is to steer you up towards that. That don't, don't just limit your Christianity to your knowledge. Use it in your, your personal life, since it's necessary for you to use it in your personal life. Knowledge is gathered over a time through the study of scriptures. It can be said that wisdom acts upon what it has learned through knowledge. In, in other words, knowledge sees a light turning red. Wisdom tells you to put brakes. Make sense? Knowledge is like, a, like knowing that there is a quicksand. Wisdom tells you to avoid it and walk from there. I mean, walk away from that. Knowledge memorizes the Ten Commands, Ten Commandments, wisdom obeys them. Knowledge learns of God, wisdom loves God. That's why wise man kept pointing us towards getting wisdom into our lives. All through the book of Proverbs, he talks about four kinds of people. And all of us will fall into those four kinds of people. Some of us may overlap two, three characteristics of that. Some of us even have all four in some places of our lives, some areas of our lives. But he addresses these four people, four types of people, and he says uh, what kind of people we should be out of these four. The first type of people, he says in Proverbs, are called the simple. 
the simple. They are not wise because nobody taught them to be wise. That's all. They're ignorant in other words. They didn't know any better. Some of our children do certain things which we are watching by sidelines and I'm trying, we are trying to tell them, don't do that, don't do that. Don't do that. But at that point of time, because they do not have experience, they do not have the knowledge, they make those mistakes. They are simple. Not because, they, they, they know, not that they know what is right, they just don't know what is right. And that's why they end up making mistakes. That's why we forgive our children. That's why we give another opportunity for young people. In fact, that's, what, that's whom he defines uh, you know, simple as. He says, he calls all the simple people as, uh, all the young people as simple people. Especially when it comes to marriage. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 7. I saw among you, among the simple, I noticed among the young men, youth who had no sense. I know our church is a young church, huh? But we will keep make, make, making mistakes because we didn't know any better. So then, how, what hap- how, do, how do we help them? Time helps them. That's the cure. Over time, over experience, they learn. They make mistakes, they make bad choices, and they learn from them. If you teach them, if you correct them, through their experience, through time, they will learn. So that's why parents don't be frustrated with young children who are right now making bad decisions. I'm not saying excuse them for bad decisions. I'm just saying don't be frustrated with their bad decisions. They will learn. They will make mistakes. They'll break their legs and they'll get straightened out. If they are learners, by the way, teach them to be a learner anyway. Simple. There's a second category he talks about. He says there are fools. The fool. The fool is someone who knows what is right and still decides not to do it. A, cho- a, a fool is someone who knows what is wrong and still decides to do it. Make sense? That is a fool. This is one kind of person pro- uh, you know, the, the, the wise man keeps going back to. And he's saying, many of us are like this. We know what is right. We know what kind of friendships we should not have. We know what kind of habits we should not have. We know how harmful, how harmful they would be to us. And yet we keep going back to them because we like them. I didn't say that. Proverbs says that. Chapter, chapter 10, verses 12, verses 23. Proverbs. Why, a, why does a fool behave like the way he behaves? Because a fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes. A fool finds pleasure in wicked skin because he enjoys it. Some of you have a question about why do you continually sin even though you know you want to get out of the sin. You know, there are some of us who pray, who ask God to help us to get rid of certain habits, certain sin, and we, we keep begging God, but yet we find ourselves going back to that. For specifically, a guy who's addicted to pornography would, would be a case point for us. Somebody who... Who knows what he's watching is wrong. He knows that he is guilty. I mean, he, it's wrong. You know, and you can see guilt in his eyes every time he watches it. He knows he should not go there. But yet he keeps finding himself going back there. Watching the same thing. At the end of watching it, coming back with, you know, heart filled with guilt and feeling overburdened about that. Why do we do that? Because we are actually enjoying it. For that moment, for the 10 seconds, for the 20 minutes, for uh, how much or long you're watching it, you, you feel like you're enjoying it. And Bible calls him a fool. Sin, when you begin to enjoy sin, you can't get rid of it. Remember that. If you enjoy what you do, you will never get rid of it. You will not. So what happens? How do we help a fool? The only way to help a fool is to allow him to face a tragedy in his life. That he would pay for the consequences of his thing, his decision, of the things that he's doing. That's why God sometimes takes off his hand from a fool because he wants this guy to actually experience an accident, actually experience a heartbreak, actually experience a pain. Remember this, we will always pay consequences for what we have done. If you know what you're doing is wrong and you still do it, you will pay for it. 
there's no doubt about it don't 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 abuse the grace of god by the way the grace of god is offered to us when we didn't know any better we didn't know what we were doing is wrong we didn't know we were sinners so the grace of god enables us to see that we are sinners and offers free choice for us to get rid of that and walk and follow god but once you know christ and you begin to know understand what is right and what is wrong and yet choose to do what is wrong you will pay for it you may not like you may not come back to capstan again but this is true that god will bring punishment to you because you know better so a fool has to pay with his tragedy and that's when he will learn hopefully he will learn there's a third category he calls them the mockers the mocker if i have to correctly define him he's a fool on steroids he's like one step more than a fool not only he knows what is right but he decides not to do it and then he goes on to criticize and judge people who are doing right he's one step more right he decides not to do what is right and then he goes one step more and starts making fun of those who are doing what is right pulling them down in front of others by mocking at them now a fool may have a hope but this fellow doesn't have a hope trust me that's why don't you ever any of you make fun of others for the sake of it for pulling down others because there is no hope for you if you start pulling somebody else's character in front of others God hates mockers. Listen to me. In fact, Bible says this. Proverbs chapter seven verses eight. He says this. Nobody can help him. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes a wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke a mocker. They will hate you. Basically, what Bible is saying is, don't even go there, man. Don't even talk to those guys. Don't even correct them because they are destroyed anyway. and they will hate you for that that's why i keep telling you please be careful how you use your words you see i this is what i've learned correct the simple he will get you the next time correct a fool he may ignore you but correct a mocker they will hate you for correcting them and he talks about the fourth category and of course all through the scripture he talks about them all through his book the wise the wise he knows this is the guy who knows what is right who knows uh, who decides to do what is right who chooses to learn more and teach to others to do what is right that's the wise guy according to the scripture these are the four types of characteristics shown to us this wise man knows what is right he chooses to do what is right then he learns more to do what is right not only that he chooses to teach and help others to do what is right why i was in fact um, proverbs chapter 9 verses 9 says this instruct the wise and they will be wiser still teach the righteous and they will add to their learning and they will add to their learning so in other words this is what i've learned correct a wise man he will thank you for that because he's growing he will thank you for that why are the wise wise that's a question and that's in fact the second part of what i want to answer today the wise are wise because they have the fear of god Proverbs chapter 9 verses 10 says this. In fact, that's why, you know, I, I, I paused there in verses 9. Verses 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Say that. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. Remember that. This is the little bit of wisdom that I want to give you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. there's no better piece of advice that i can give you um you know if i if i can take all the books in this world all the knowledge that i've got all the wisdom that i've learned from others and going through my own life this is the only piece of advice that i can give you 
be in fear of you, your God. Fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God. Don't confuse fear and af uh, being afraid of God. Fear of wisdom begins and ends with God. It ends with fear of God specifically. It isn't fear like, like, like a fear of being, uh, being uh, uh, struck by a lightning or li like a fear um, of being struck, st uh, you know, st struck dead through, you know, in an accident. Um, it is a deep abiding reverence for who God is. It's a deep abiding reverence, holy reverence and respect for who God is, his word. Where there is fear of God, there tends to be obedience to God. And that gives you wisdom. You see, God prefers obedience over sacrifice. It doesn't matter how much you give to God, God is more interested in how much you are obeying him. Obeying his word, following his will in your life. You will only obey God if you are in fear of God. If you can understand who your God is and then choose to follow him in spite of who he is and obey all that he says, then that gives you wisdom. Somebody said like this, failure is being successful at the things that really don't matter. Failure is being successful at things that really don't matter. What things don't matter? The fame that you're looking for doesn't matter. The popularity that you're searching for doesn't matter. The money, the fortune that you're trying to make for doesn't matter. The fulfillment that you're trying to find through friendships, through, 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 through relationships, through, through uh, you know, compromising your morality doesn't matter. You may be successful in your job. You may be successful in your business. You may be successful in the, in the way that you invest money and make fortune out of that. You may be successful in making friendships, hundreds and thousands of them in your network, powerful people in your network. You may be successful, but in the sight of God, you are a failure. Because you missed one thing, fear of God. Chances are that there are people here today, this morning, in this place, who don't have the fear of God. Not that you don't want to have the fear of God, but just that you took God for granted. And that's why this morning I want to remind you three things about God that you need to remember always. Number one, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. You know, we have this picture of a God who is merciful, who is loving, who is benevolent who forgives all our sins, who died on the cross for us. In fact, that's what we remembered as we partook in communion. We have that picture. Sometimes that picture of a loving God can blur the actual essence of God. That we forget that God is the boss. That God is sovereign. I mean, Solomon got it right in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, uh, verses 11, uh, chapter 29, verses 11. This is how Solomon sings, yours, O Lord, sorry, David sings, yours, O Lord, this greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Look at the description of God. Huh? One step after another, and after another. Yours, O God, is greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in heavens. And on the earth is yours, O Lord, and in this kingdom is yours. This is the greatest king ever lived on the earth, the most powerful man on the earth. He's singing out to God and saying, my kingdom is not my kingdom, it's your kingdom. In other words, he's saying, my life is not my life, it's yours. We forget that your life, you forget that your life, your job, your, your business actually belongs to God. When you forget that, you don't have fear of God. When you forget the education that you've got, the promotions that you're receiving, the skills that you've got as a musician or any other skills that you've got, everything belongs to God. You forget that for a moment, you will stop worshipping Him. You may be singing songs, you may be making melody, but you're not worshipping God. You belong to God. 
God owns you. You better remember that. He's sovereign. He's a sovereign ruler of the universe. No, there is no higher authority. He's all powerful so that no one can force him to do anything against his will. He's all, uh, he's ever present, ev present everywhere so that no one can hide from him. He is all knowing so there is nothing to know about for God that he's unaware of in your life. You can't hide anything from God. He already knows everything that you are. You can hide it in front of people. You can put a mask in front of people. You can't put a mask in front of God. He knows you. He, I said you, he owns you. He said, the best part is this, that in spite of owning you, he's actively involved in your life and giving you a choice to make a right choice. But that is the love of God. That's why we partake in communion. That's why we, under, that's where we come to understanding, oh, this is a loving God. But in, the, in this, we forget that he is the one who is the owner. God's rule is supreme, paramount and absolute. Don't, don't over everything in your life. Your children belong to God. Their future belongs to God. Their purpose belongs to God. So don't you own your children. Huh? They belong to God. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28 says this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. Let me just make a statement and then I'll move on to the next one. The problem with us is this. That we find it difficult to accept God's authority. God's authority over our life. Over our money. Over our children or our jobs. We forget honoring him for who he is because we lost the concept of his majesty. With a little sense of majesty, the sense of the majesty of God, you can make your life better, you know. But because you lost your sense of majesty of God, you would walk into the church anytime you want. You would not feel like worshipping God because the singer is not singing well. The sound is not coming out well. You don't want to sing. You don't want to lift up your hands because you don't feel like lifting your hands. You want to stand however you want. You want to sing whatever song you like to sing. If you don't like the song, you don't sing. You do, you lost the fear of God. Have you forgotten that for God, the music doesn't matter, the lights don't matter, the sound doesn't matter? Do you forget that God is God? The moment you forget that, worship becomes stale, everything becomes mediocre. What you offer to God becomes mediocre. That's our problem. But understanding the sovereignty of God causes us to take focus from ourselves away and to focus on Him. So this is what you're going to do today. This is what, what should happen in worship. That you, when you come to worship and as, as the worship team begins to sing, it's not the point of singing the songs along with them. The point is that is the time created for you to begin to offer every area of your life to the rightful owner. Your fears, your struggles, your children, the problems, your blessings, your successes. You're actually telling God, God, this belongs to you. This belongs to you. This belongs. I belong to you. Think like your, think like you, 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 think like your home is like a home. Uh, your life is like a home with rooms, many rooms. That every area of your life, you walk into each room and dedicate both the room and the contents inside it. To God. That's why we give off, we give so much time worship. So that you have enough opportunity to come to God and say, God, I have fears, I'm offering them to you. Thank you for the job, I'm offering this to you. I know it's yours. That you have opportunity to acknowledge his ownership over your life. God is sovereign. 
your view of god really matters in the way that you worship don't forget that number 2 god is holy god is holy don't you forget that god is holy that while god is loving he is a holy god you don't focus too much on his love and forget who he is he is holy i don't know how to describe you know that the best definitions of holiness of god could could file could fi- could fall short of what he is you know no matter how rich the words may look like in the dictionaries or that i could come up with and conjure up in explaining the holiness of i can't define it let me just define it with one one statement god is pure god is pure there is no impurity in him he can't tolerate impurity he can't tolerate sin he can't even tolerate a little bad thought and you walk into this place with all your wicked thoughts do you not know that god can strike you down instantly like he did uzza uzza for god that god is holy the guy who was in charge of bringing the ark of covenant from his home all the way to uh, to david's uh, david's home that was his, uh, that was his job he took the responsibility of bringing the ark of covenant from his home to there what he did is he put it on a bullock cart as he was bringing it the bullock cart the wheels of the bullock cart ca- fell into a uh, into a small pit and then the ark of the covenant was about to fall uzza like the good man he was thought i mean uh, this is a holy thing i need to keep it you know i need to keep it from falling and he puts his hand and uh, and tries to stop the ark of covenant from hitting the ground bible says god instantly killed him the way god killed him put fear even in david's heart david got terrified with the way god killed him why do you think god killed uzza is it because he touched the ark of covenant now god killed uzza because uzza forgot how holy god is and how a holy god deserves your utmost respect how do you respect god by following everything that he asks you to do uzza's one job is to take care of the ark of covenant that was his job right from the time of moses his entire family is dedicated for one job singular job take care of the ark of covenant and whenever you move the ark of covenant the one thing that you are supposed to do is never touch it the only way to to take it from one place to the other place is to carry it by your shoulder uzza thought my shoulders will hurt 986 kgs by the way that covenant was ark of covenant even if four people are four people are carrying it's going to hurt their their shoulders the problem is that once they lift it up they can't put it down till they reach the place so uzza would have thought why bother carrying it let's put it on the bullock cart and take it you saw for our convenience we disrespect the holiness of god and that's what we do all the time that's why our, our worship doesn't bring that that sense of awe inside us because you don't have an awe of god inside you you forgot how holy god is you forgot that you don't deserve to stand here and lead worship or sing songs or stand here and preach that none of us deserve to do what we are supposed what do what we are doing that we could be killed instantly for the un- for the kind of unholiness that we have inside us it was the love of christ that saves us from the holiness of god by the way remember that thank god for jesus god knows that he would kill you instantly he could kill us instantly but he loved us so much that he put jesus in between us and him you better not forget it while re- while remembering the sacrifice of cross don't you ever forget the holiness of god God is holy. Number three, God is right. God is right. I can't explain this 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 point more, but let me just 
tell you one more time, reiterate this. God is always right. You may not think God is right. You may think that what is happening in your life is wrong. You may think that what is happening in your life is injustice. The thing that you're facing at your workplace, the kind of things that you're facing with people are, are really injustice and, are, and you wonder how a loving God can allow this. I want you to know this. God is always right. Always right. Absolutely, 100% right. If you, don't forget, if you forget that, you're going to be bitter against God. If you forget that, you're going to keep crying to God, keep questioning God, keep walking away from God. You've got to understand, God is always right. How can He be always right? Because He knows. Describing the knowledge of God, John simply puts it in those two statements, those two words. God knows. God knows. Because he knows, he will always do what is right. He knows what's happening inside your heart. He knows what's happening around you. He knows what's happening at your workplace. He knows what's happening in your relationships. He knows what kind of decisions you're making. You know, he knows how foolish those decisions were. He knows what kind of consequences those decisions would bring. He knows what kind of good decisions would, uh, would, uh, would, would, uh, what kind of consequences would come out of good, good decisions. He knows every single thing, even before they come to be. So he's going to be right, absolutely right, 100% right all the time. So what he said in the scripture is always right. Not even a single thing is wrong in this. Every single word that has been brought to us is right. You may question it because of your own experiences, but this is right. Not you, not Einstein. This is right. Always right. Thousands came into this world. Thousands tried to prove this wrong. This has always stood the time, test of time. This is always right. I don't think anybody better than David can put it you know, into perspective for us. Let me read that. Psalm 19 verses 7 to 11. The law of God is perfect and reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure and enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Um, they are more precious than gold, than much more pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from a comb. By, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And listen, because God is right, He will always tell you what is right. Because God is holy, He will always tell you what is pure. Because God is sovereign, Every plan that he gives you, he's got control of it. Everything that he asks you to do, he's got control of it. That's probably what Paul understood when he wrote Romans chapter 8, verse 28. He says, he makes all things work out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his will. Now you make sense of that words? Because God is, ho God is sovereign, because God is holy, and because God is right, whatever he asks you to do, his will. Because it is perfect, He will make sure everything works out for your own good. You see, He doesn't have to, but He chooses to do it for your good. That is the goodness of God. That, if you can understand that, that He's, he's got everything under His hand, that He's a holy God, that He deserves my respect, my utmost respect, my utmost, us, utmost us, attention, uh, that he's right and everything he says is right, so therefore I need to do it, then you have a fear of God. And that begins wisdom inside you. So little, this is the little bit of wisdom that I want to give you. When I understand what it means to fear the Lord, I will live my life fearlessly. 
when I understand what it means to fear the Lord, then I can live freely. <laughs>